construction. No? Tom, you know a bit about construction. Don't you? Mm. Anyway, do you remember construction though? No? Years ago. Years ago. Oh, yeah. Years ago. Yeah. There's um, um, in modern construction techniques, they use um, when they build these big tall buildings, uh, they use piles. You know, so they are they drill them down into the earth. So they have these big augers and they drill down right. and then they put in these steel cages and they fill it with concrete. So and from there they build their multi-story. It's incredible, really, that they're able to build buildings like so high. You know, never in the history of man, even Babylon, they couldn't. You know, the, bat, the Tower of Babel, they weren't able to go anywhere near the heights that they were going. To. But in the ancient times, they didn't have reinforced uh, concrete. They didn't have steel bar, um, rebar, and they didn't have concrete, they never even been invented. They had, so they had mortar, but they didn't have all the knowledge that modern science has and engineering techniques have for constructing very strong materials, you know, by combining different materials and assembling them in a certain way. But what they did in the ancient times when they wanted to build their most impressive buildings is the, um, the hewed stone, the cut stone from from the ground, basically. So they cut large blocks of stone and they would build um, using these large blocks of stone. They're very uh, big buildings. I don't know if anyone's been out around Turkey or you know Asia Minor or any of these places. If, if you ever get a chance to go out there, it's highly recommended. It's not just beautiful, but it's very interesting historically. You know, these places where Smyrna and Pergamum and Ephesus and all these places were. But if you walk down the streets in Ephesus, you'll see the first library in the world. And you'll see the big, big pillars there. And you'll see the, the big chunks of stone that are in the, in the base of these buildings. And the same with the temples all around there. There were different temples and different gods and so on. And just to paint a picture here of where I'm going with this, the, um, when Jesus was walking on the earth and he was ministering for three and a half years in his native country of Israel and he did a lot of ministry around the temple in Jerusalem and he did a lot of ministry around Jerusalem. Matter of fact he knew he had to die in Jerusalem because a prophet doesn't die outside of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was as, as significant for Jesus as it was for any Jew and still is a very significant city for the Jews. Actually the, the most significant um, city in the world for the Jewish people. And Jesus was very aware of what the um, what it is that spoke to the people, you know, from, from his environment. You know, if you grew up in a country, you kind of know how to talk to a person in that country. You kind of know that if you mention certain things, the kind of imagery it would create, the kind of response it would create. And Jesus knew his country, he knew his people, and he knew um, his city and the city of Jerusalem, and particularly he knew the temple. And this city of Jerusalem was built on um, a hill, actually a number of hills. And when they were building these ancient cities, you know the Wailing Wall, most people know that wall. Well that wall was very, very deep. But you're seeing what's above the ground. But beneath the ground, they're only excavating now. As a matter of fact, they've only now, in the last maybe, um, maybe three, four years, have gone down to the actual bedrock. I don't know if they're quite at the bedrock, but they've gone down very low at this wall. And I was looking this morning at a, a, a stone from this wall. And this one stone in this wall, that would have been all done by hand now. And um, this stone, stone, the guy was saying, was 600 tons in weight. He says that with all the knowledge that archaeologists have and scientists have and people in construction have today, they cannot figure out how they got such a monster storm into position as to where it is. They just can't figure it out. They, they, you know, they, I know the Mayans, they come up with theories with those big statues, you know, that were on the ground. 
but they cannot come up with um, an explanation for this. And, and Jesus, when he was, when, when God was speaking through the prophets, before Jesus came, like hundreds of years before Jesus came, he made a statement in Isaiah 28 verse 16. And it says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. And here's God speaking in a language of imagery. I mean, right through the scriptures, God doesn't use a language of, of um, like a technical language or a, or a very rational language. But he doesn't use irrational languages. He actually uses what's called analogical language, which is the language of imagery. Because the language of imagery speaks to the heart. And the language of imagery can convey truth, particularly spiritual truths. And he's talking to his people, um, Israel, and about their... He wanted Israel to be a people that would reflect him to the world, like, like a kind of a beacon, that would reflect to the world what God's like. So he wants, in other words, to be an example of, you know, of godliness and so forth. And of course, they continuously um, rebelled because of hardness of heart and, and so on and so forth. And, and God was so often disappointed with his people. But he made a statement somewhere along the line during their rebellious years, because they were so rebellious, because they wouldn't listen, because they wouldn't heed his word, because they wouldn't submit, he says, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation. And the thing that the Jews would have understood that, because to lay a foundation stone back in Jerusalem was no small feat. No small feat at all. You had to, um, what they figured out with a lot of the stones around Jerusalem, that the stones were actually hewn from within the base rock of the city. There's a kind of a limestone in it that they, they'd hewn out these massive caverns. I don't know, they must have been just pretty strong guys. But these massive caverns, and they hewed out the blocks of stone. And what they did is, because it was so deep under the earth, they would go up vertically, and they would Hewn hew, hew out an opening up, you know, at the surface level, and they would have a stone covering that, but they would remove that stone, and they would, the, the, certainly the stones that were liftable, they would lift them up with pulleys and ropes or something, I don't quite know how, but they would lift them up vertically up there and then bring them over. So they were hewn out underneath the city to build what you see above the ground. So everything of ancient Jerusalem came from underneath it, so to speak, as in building it. And so people understood who, who had been involved at that time with the temple and with its reconstruction when they came back from Babylon and so forth. They would have understood how enormous a feat that is to do. To build a stone. You know, to put, put, put cornerstones in, put foundation stones in. It was an extraordinary feat of human effort. Extraordinary. You needed a lot of people to do this. And thousands of them actually. And you had some of um, it, it, like the, I suppose the temple that in Jerusalem at the time was probably the greatest construction on the face of the earth at its time. But these stones being, being so enormous and demanding such skill and precision, they say that with the stones that what they've discovered with the, with the foundation stones in Jerusalem is they discovered that there's writing on them and they believe the writing are the names of the masons uh, or the signature of the masons plus they had other kind of hieroglyphics writing on it that would be defining where this fits. I mean, these fitted so well, these stones, and built by um, human hands, that they didn't use any mortar, nor did they need mortar. But they, when they were fitted so well together, they would fuse together without any cement concrete. They had this thing down to the millimeter in the ancient time. And how they did it, I have no idea, really. You can just surmise, but I don't really know the precision and the accuracy in it, but the enormity of the weights that were involved has baffled people, even still today, as to how some of this was actually done. 
And so here's God alluding to the, te the temple and its foundation that existed at the time, which would have been a major, major project. You know, I don't know what the biggest construction project in Ireland at the moment is. Um, I actually don't know. But, you know, if you take some, somewhere like where, okay, like where they built the two towers, where they came down and where they built these new towers, that's probably the, one of the bigger construction projects in America uh, in recent times. And it would have been something on a similar scale. Or something like the, the, the scale where they, where they built a bridge from Denmark to Sweden. You know, one of these enormous things, or a bridge that the Russians built recently from Crimea to the Russian mainland. So, it was like the, the focus of all the effort of the nation, if you like, and all its resources towards getting this project done. And here's God saying then, a little bit tongue-in-cheek to the Jewish people. Because you're not listening, you're building your temple, you're doing all this with the gods, but you're not listening or paying heed to me. And so he says, but behold, I lay. And notice he doesn't say that in past tense. And he's speaking like, what is it, um, Isaiah was about 730 years before Christ. God is speaking in present tense, because there's no time with God. He sees the beginning from the end. And actually we were all in him before the foundation of the earth. So I'm thinking about that one in the desert. <laughs> see, see, how, see how well you can understand it. But he says, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation. So of course, that would have got their mind going about the temple. And about you know, the stones that were laid in it. And he says about this stone, this is a tried stone. And what a tried stone, like anything that's tried... Another word for tried is to be tested. In other words, I, I studied civil engineering and when I was at university, um, we used to do um, strength analysis. And we used to do various strength tests and different tests on different materials to see how much uh, pressure they could take, and tension or compression, and there was calculations around this sort of thing or whatever. And that's kind of, uh, I suppose, really the whole thing about civil engineering, it's all about understanding uh, the, the strengths and the weaknesses in material and how to combine them in, in such and such a way. And so we would have to test materials. Matter of fact, we had to learn all the tests with concrete. And we had all, I don't want to get to what I did in college, but we had to learn all how to test concrete, how to prove it, whatever. But it had to be tested, so that when it's put in place in the site, it's actually going to function the way the theory says it's going to function. And he's talking about a tried stone and a precious cornerstone. The cornerstone, um, in, if you can imagine Jerusalem, the cornerstone was, you look at the city, it's all of these hills, and they're building this wall around it. The cornerstone is the deepest point to the bedrock. It's like 100 feet down. I looked down a... Um, a hole in tank last week that was 33 feet deep and it seemed a long way down. This was three times further down underneath the earth to the very bedrock. And then what was placed there was a cornerstone. And in the ancient times, unlike the modern times when we use um, piles and steel to support buildings, the cornerstone was critical. It was the most critical stone. It was actually adorned in many cases and um, you know, meant to look, even though it would never be seen, it was, it was a very precious stone. In other words, it was built uniquely, to very unique specifications, to carry a city, in a sense. Because here's the very lowest point, and this is the cornerstone. Everything is built out from there. And the stresses then in the walls are transferred, the load stresses are transferred down, some into the ground. But most, not well, significant portions of it going directly to this cornerstone. This stone is taking more pressure than any other stone in either the temple or the wall. And it's very deep and it's actually hidden. And this was the cornerstone. We have not yet, to the best of my knowledge, found the cornerstone for um, either the city of Jerusalem, its walls, or the temple. I might be wrong, but I don't think we found it. But here's 
God speaking about this precious cornerstone. And of course, having a, a stone like that gives you a sure foundation. It, it was the most essential element. Here you're on the bedrock. This is your big, big stone. This would probably be certainly over 100 tons. Probably more. And that's a huge weight. But this is, it's expensive, it's precious because it's, it's so hard to make. It has to be made to a very specific dimensions and so on. And it becomes then a sure foundation. If that's laid wrong, if that's laid anyway skewer, if the material is defective, what will happen is it will crack. And a crack in the cornerstone will affect the whole building. It affects everything. The walls will begin to grow, you know, in a bit, and everything will move down. And also you have to remember that it was built in a place in Jerusalem was a, an area which is affected by earthquakes. Something we don't have here, but it's something you have to be able to withstand those forces as well. And this is going back, you know, long before. And then he says this, whoever believes will not act hastily. Um, another translation of it says, will not be disturbed. Another translation says, will not be in a hurry. But in, I think it's in Romans... There's a reference actually if Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14 says, again this is speaking, it's, all this is about Jesus. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Again, there's an allusion here, not so much to a, a cornerstone, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. And in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, it says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will be put to shame. Actually, yeah. with with that scripture, there are two scripture references. Um, he's, he's, the, the writer has combined two Old Testament scripture references into one. So one is from Isaiah 28 verse 16, which is the second half. And the first half is just what we read from Isaiah 8 verse 14. But he says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And another translation of it says, will not be disappointed. So there's a lot of, I suppose there's, there's a lot of opinion about how you actually translate that last one. But the New Testament um, translators in uh, Romans 9 verse 33, they say, well it's the New King James Version, but the one I was reading, which is American Standard, says, will not be disappointed. And that actually literally means be put to shame. So, here's God talking about a stone. A precious cornerstone. And Romans chapter 10 verse 11 says, Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And that actually probably, that's literally the most accurate translation of it. The interpretive people who, you know, like Bibles, like from an interpretive point of view, they would say will not be disappointed. But that's literally what it means, will not be put to shame. And that's the issue around our relationship with God in reality. The, the issue around our relationship with God is, is not so much about how we feel. And though God gives us joy and He gives us these you know, wonderful spiritual experiences within our heart. But the issue is more of a sober one. And I said to Brenda this morning, every time I do a preparation for church, I realise how serious it is to reject Christ. I don't get, you know, sometimes you don't think, but when you read the scriptures and you just begin to put things together, you realize how serious it is to reject Christ. Because 
Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Implying whoever does not believe in him will be put to shame. There's a reality when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, he, he said, There's no one comes to God except through me. And he said, him, He positioned himself and declared himself to be the only way. That he was this stone that was being spoken about. Jesus actually, when he actually talked about this, he called out the Jewish leadership. He called them out and he used these scriptures, which were ancient, ancient scriptures that these men were being very familiar with from ancient times. And he called them out on this particular issue for their condemnation, ultimately. Because they had the knowledge of the scriptures. And here was the fulfillment. Because obviously this is literal. It's God is using the, the, you know, the, 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 the visual experiences of people to speak concerning the reality. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 11 it says, Coming to him... That's us coming to Christ as to a living stone. A very unusual way to describe somebody as a living stone. Rejected indeed by men, which Jesus was, but chosen by God and precious. You also, it's us in this house this morning, as living stones, this we a band called the Rolling Stones one time. <laughs> but I've never heard of a man called living stones. <laughs> but that's how scripture describes us here. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Therefore it is also contained in scripture. Behold, I lay inside a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes in him will be by no means put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble, and by the way, that, that particular scripture, stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, that wasn't an Old Testament reference. That was Jesus' words that he spoke when he pointed something else out about himself. They stumbled being disobedient to the word to, the word to which they were also appointed. And that is a very strange thing. That God appoints some people to disobedience. The Lord has created everything for Himself, even the wicked, for a day of destruction. You have to really think about that if, if you're to grasp its deeper significance. But you also are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Obviously, here's Paul, so aware of who he is, so aware of what it means to be a blood-purchased saint however you may feel about yourself, and wanting always to reflect the best of who God is through his mortal flesh. And he lived to a standard that, um, that very few Christians live to, in reality. In 
Psalm 118, verse 22. This is where we find this famous statement that Jesus made. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. You see, there's this interplay in the language of the scripture between the references to the physical temple that existed in Jesus' time in Jerusalem and to the ultimate reality of what God was intending to do was to build a spiritual temple. A temple that you cannot um, cement together with Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In Matthew chapter 21 verse 42 it says Jesus said to them have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone this was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes and when Jesus said this he was speaking to the Jewish establishment at the time and he, they had actually declared their own faith because in the previous parable they declared that the unrighteous they, they, there was, I don't know if you're familiar with the parable where this man had a vineyard he sent his servants in to reap the harvest they beat them up and threw them out then he sent more servants in they beat them up and they threw them out and then he sent his own son in and he said he's the heir let's kill him and we'll have to think for ourselves and they killed him and, he, and Jesus had said to them what should be done to the person you know the people who've done this and they said that the, those wretched uh, people should should basically be killed and they were calling out themselves that's why Jesus then turns this on he turns this against them I mean they act, it's an amazing thing with parables you can see this in scripture where a parable can be used for you to proclaim judgment upon yourself by proclaiming judgment upon the person in power. And actually the, the Pharisees fully understood that Jesus was pointing the finger at them. They fully understood that. And they set about to, to kill him because of that. This was the Lord's doing. It was marvellous in his sight. And in verse 44, Jesus goes on. And this isn't Old Testament scripture. But New Testament scripture is every bit as valid. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to power. Now there's some allusions here. One, of course, is the Jewish nation. This stone fell on them. And the irony of the whole thing is, when the Romans came in in, in 70 AD, they dismantled large, large portions of the temple. Because they wanted to get the gold that was in there. Now. And they destroyed the place. And they destroyed the nation. The nation was completely destroyed. A nation of like maybe two million people plus was completely destroyed. Complete. City, everything. And people were moved to all the Gentile nations and taken hostage for centuries. And we're all familiar with you know, what happened along the way. Um, without going into it, this scripture is, is really important. It's repeated in Mark 12, verses 10 and 11, Luke 20, verses 17 and 18. Acts 4.11 and Ephesians 2 uh, verse, well, verses 19 to 22 or 2 now therefore speaking of us you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And there it's, sorry, but there it's clearly stating that the cornerstone that has been spoken of by Isaiah was Jesus Christ himself. And so here's Jesus Christ in whom the whole building, that's the body of Christ, the worldwide body of Christ, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in whom the whole building being fitted together goes into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit there is this um, invisible 
unifying force called God and unifying the hearts and minds of people into a collective unit called church. Church is not a building from the point of view of scripture. The church is not a, um, a place of hierarchy. The church is an assembly of people assembled by God. And even though right now the church is quite splintered, we can be of no doubt that God's intention continues to be to bring the stones together in a proper fashion. So whatever you're calling, whatever you're gifting, whatever God has intended for you to do and be, it will always be God's desire to move you into your great position. That you are rightly placed within the church of Jesus Christ. That you are rightly fitted in the body of Christ. That you are rightly fitted in your calling. That might be in a, a local assembly. It might be in a, a national assembly. It might be in, a, in terms of your calling, your gifting, your, maybe your ministry calling, whatever. It's always God trying to build this temple, moving things together. And that's why Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's not physically building a church. He's building a spiritual place. A spiritual place where he can dwell like his spirit. Like Brother was saying on Thursday nights, and I know some of us have been here, the presence of God just comes. It's just awesome. But here we are, God's inhabiting. He's building. He's inhabiting. Not just the individual level, me and God, but the corporateness of God. Where God is seeking to fit people in such a way who are rightly disposed to why? So we can offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of worship. That we can offer spiritual sacrifice to Him to call us out of darkness into His glorious light. The clear praises of Him who call us in darkness into His light. We have a, a you know, like being in an assembly, someone I met yesterday, and they asked me, can you give me a word from the Lord? Can you give me in a car park? So someone I met. And immediately I said, you need to be a church. Speaking of his the person said, I've been thinking about that. It goes actually without saying that you have to be connected to people. Without saying, if you are to understand what God is attempting to do here. It's not about whether you choose the church to do this or this. But you have to be connected to people. For God to inhabit his church. And this is what's happening throughout the world. In some place large assemblies, some place small assemblies. God is building, building, building a spiritual habitation here on the earth for his presence. Just like the ancients built a tabernacle for the presence of God. In just to make a point of reference here on the cornerstone which Jesus was, he talks about Jesus being a tested cornerstone. And this word tested is a, a Greek word, p, uh, pirazo, spelled P E I R A Z O, pirazo. And it simply means putting to proof. So someone tells you, this can take 50 kilonewtons weight, pressure, you put 50 kilonewtons on it, it doesn't crack, can. You understand? So it's a test. And Jesus was a tested corner stone. Just on that word tested in the New Testament, the, the, the word tempt or temptation is the same word in the Greek. But there's a difference between being tested and being tempted. And I just, this, this one little thing I can know that I picked up. Satan tempts us to prove that we are not who God says we are. And God tests us 
prove that we are exactly who he says we are. You see the contest? The devil comes, I say it again, to prove that we are not who God says we are. And God tests us to prove that we are exactly who he says we are. That actually probably is the, but the, you have the same word test, tempt. Tempt to me is when Satan's doing it. Test is when God's doing it. And this is something that we have to kind of be mindful of as believers. That we will face temptation. But the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And it also says that we will be tested. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, it talks about a time of testing for the whole world. But there is a time of testing to what? To prove your faith genuinely. To prove your faith genuinely. Because in many, many congregations within Christendom, there are people sitting in churches who say they believe. And anyone can say it. But it's not to test, <coughs> but it's proved. And there's a proving that has to take place. And I'm not quite sure why that has to happen. But it may possibly be something like the scenario with Job, where Job, you know, where the devil went to God and said, He only is, you know, is faithful to you and is righteous and so forth, because you give him so much. You bless him with so much goods. And God says, Okay, take away, you know, his goods. God entered into a um, Dialogue with Lucifer, and he wanted to prove the devil wrong. And I believe, I, I don't understand in the spiritual realm how that relationship with God interplays even now. I don't really quite understand it. But enough to say that it did happen in the, you know, in the book of Job, that here's a contest for what's genuine. And actually, that's what God is looking for. God. It wants to find out what's genuine. If you look at um, a scripture, I'm skipping ahead here a long way, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder. Now that's what Paul spoke about his ministry as he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was a master builder. In other words, he was building faith into people's lives and he was building relationships together. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So he laid the foundation which is Christ Jesus. He brought the revelation of Christ Jesus to these early churches. That's why he was called out by God for that set purpose that his son might be revealed through him, through a man. That Jesus might be revealed through a man. And that was Paul. He had a foundation of ministry. He was an apostle to the Gentiles, going to people 100% pagan. And God, through supernatural power, revealing his son to these people. And so he taught them, and he nurtured them, and he gave them a lot of basic truth and basic understanding. And then others would come, sorry, verse 10 there again, who would also minister, and he said, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. The foundation which is Christ. Yep. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Remember the foundation stone of the church is Christ Jesus. Chosen by God and precious to him. That is the foundation of our church. Everything is leaning on him. Everything. Even still, there's no me and my, it's everything is leaning on Christ, everything. He is supporting this invisible structure that God is pulling together. But it's an invisible structure, which is in part through revelation. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, they're pretty expensive things, wood, hair or straw, which are pretty common, each one's work will become clear. 
for the day will declare it. And that's alluding to the day of the Lord. This is a capital D. Because it will be revealed by fire. Remember the present heavens, the present earth, reserved for judgment by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built and it endures, he will receive a reward. And remember, the, the, the testing that's spoken of here is more similar to when someone is refining gold or refining silver. They're taking out the dross. They use heat and they extract some of the metals that are, if you like, not uh, pure. The impurities are removed. If anyone's work, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he will be saved yet as through fire. And there's a warning in Scripture now, even for us as believers, that our work will be tested because we all minister to some degree, whether it's in the church or without. But our work will be tested to see it tested for quality. God wants to test the quality of our work. Whether it really is wrong of God or not. Some people can be quite driven in good works. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's birthed in God. Paul said somewhere in the scripture, he said, when the only thing that counts is faith operating in love. If you believe, you're, you're in, in genuine faith, and then you step out because of that faith into action, motivated by love. So we can do the right thing for the wrong motives. Maybe sometimes we could do the wrong thing with the right motives. But God ultimately tests. When that test for purity of our works takes place, the motivation will come up. And if the motivation is wrong, it's consumed. The attitude. If the attitude is wrong, it will be consumed. But if you remain purity of heart, and your relationship with God is a pure one. And you, you know, one of the purest of all pure actions and works was Jesus' crucifixion. And yet he struggled so much with it, not wanting to go. But he kept saying, not my will, but yours be done. He knew what God wanted. Sometimes we fail to apprehend what God wants from us. Or primarily wants us to do. We could spend our life, even as believers, doing a lot of good things. And some of it might be worthy. But there might be something greater that God wants you to do. Something of greater value than worth. So God tests the quality of our work. And you know, one, one thing I found in just a relationship with God over the years, because you know, you, you're at different places during your life. I found this very helpful. That if you can pour out your heart to if you can find a place that you can go and you can pour out your heart to God, even with tears, especially with tears, in a place, something happens for me in that place, and I haven't been there for, for a long time, but something happens in that where there's such, um, such a, a realness, there's just such realness about what you're saying to God. Because sometimes we can say to Things that we don't really mean. No, we can say things we don't really mean. We say, oh, yeah, I'll meet you tomorrow at half four. <laughs> you don't care last week, I'll be there or not. You know, sometimes we don't really mean, even in our prayers, that the earnest prayers of a righteous man avail it much. There's an attitude that, in our hearts that has to be right, really, in our service to God, in what He has for us to do. God tested Abraham. Genesis 22, verse 1. We won't go to all these. He wanted to prove that Abraham loved him. Joseph tested his brothers in Genesis 42, verse 15. They're, they had to bring back their, their little brother Benjamin and hand him over to Joseph. The Israelites tested the Lord. Now this was in a negative sense. In Exodus 17, verse 7. They wanted better food. They didn't like the food God was supplying them. They put it into order. And God was very angry with them. As a matter of fact, testing God like that is forbidden in Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, which Jesus quoted to the devil. He says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. We do not have any, um, 
writes the test card in that respect. We're putting him to a test of himself. But there is a different context where God can be tested in his promises. It's a different thing. So God makes you a promise. Yeah, you can that promise can be tested. Um, in Psalm 17, verse 3, it says, you have, the psalmist says, You have tried my heart, you have visited me by night, you have tested me, and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Such a good thing to keep with your conscience before God. Such a good thing. Three pillars that Paul lived by, keeping a clear conscience, pure heart, and a genuine faith. If your conscience is pure, you can have such a confidence in God when you approach it. If you keep it pure. You know, it, just, it just does that. You just know I'm, I'm being real. I'm being real here. And that's something that's hard to be, being real to ourselves. But when you are real to yourself and honest, then you know God's made provision for everything. If we have a sin, He says, confess it. He forgives, forgives your sins and cleanses from all unrighteousness. But we ought to endeavour to keep our conscience clean. Proverbs 27 verse 21 talks about this. It says, The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and a man is tested by his praise. A lot of, a lot of Dublin people getting praised yesterday after winning the all Ireland final. They're tested by that. That can go to their heads. And you have a man from the county I came in, and he was very significant in a particular victory, in a match, and everyone ended up buying him a drink. And he ended up buying a ball. He ended up becoming an alcoholic. You know, in a way you're tested by your praise, whether that causes your ego to become enlarged, particularly men, particularly kings, or whether you can appraise it properly. It's not really good to say, oh, that's not me. Or, no, it's, it's okay to be, you know, to be proud of an achievement. Or to feel good about something you've accomplished. If someone genuinely says it. But just be careful of not being flattered. Because that's a trap for your feet. Um, Jesus was tested by the Pharisees. Which they shouldn't have done. Because you don't put the Lord to your test. They try to catch him in his words. Matthew chapter 9 verse 3. Deacons and elders in the local church. 1 Timothy 3 verse, chapter 3 verse 10. Should be tested. Because one thing is when we come to Christ. Our character is not Christ like. Our character takes a lifetime to form. But when we come to Christ, we have new birth into a living home. So we come into the fellowship. So maybe we're a little bit prone to, you know, there's a few extra bob I can take out of the basket and, you know, no one here. It's all ours, we're all one, we're all one big family. The little things, you know, and you might, you know, but you have to be tested in the church to be proved. That's why in employers, good employers, they take a person in on a six month probation. To see if this person like is going to cause too much bother and or whether they can produce the result that they required and so on. So testing is even a principle that's used in life. Uh, 1 Peter 1 chapter 7. If you've got that one. Yeah, 6 to 8. In this you greatly rejoice. He's just talking about suffering that the church had gone through. And he says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness, and that is the word we need to underline, because God's interest in what's genuine. If you ever meet a person, that guy's genuine. You just kind of know someone. The genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perish. You know, the genuineness of your faith. If you had a, one of those big gold bars, you know, that you see in the, in, the, in the central banks. It's more precious. The genuineness of your faith is more precious than that gold. Though it is tested, because gold perishes ultimately. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, Though well, now you do not see him yet believe, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. There's a testing of our faith to see that it's genuine. So the day the Lord visits us and visits us, that there may be rejoicing among the angels. You know, when the kingdom of God 
comes to this earth, I believe we're going to see the Lord's return in our lifetime. But when, that, when it comes about, there'll be a such a rejoicing over the saints who have served God anonymously and faithfully. Such rejoicing over the genuineness of their faith. Angels rejoicing. Heaven singing. A people who have endured and withstood the testing of the various trials that this world has unfortunately prepared for us. Just to make the point, the devil tests believers in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 where they were to be put in prison for 10 days to be tested by the devil. The devil tempted Jesus, which is the same as, it's, it's not the same as testing, but the, je the devil had the brass neck to do it. Matthew 4 verse 1, Mark 1 13, Luke 4 verse 2. And of course Jesus was God. And God cannot be tempted by evil. It says in James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it let, let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own evil desires. God tempts nobody to sin. As a matter of fact, when you are tempted to sin, God makes it on behalf. We are in a tension in this world as long as we're in this world between Lucifer and demonic forces, and God and angelic forces. And we're living in this realm within us, because the kingdom of God is within, and the enemy will, impe will appeal to our lusts to draw us in to sin. God, by His Holy Spirit, will continuously appeal to our spirit to draw us into holiness. And whom you yield on to is whom you serve. That's a fact. Even if you think the word of yourself, <laughs> whom you yield to is whom you serve. If you yield to the flesh, from the flesh, the weak day, the scripture says, but if you yield to the spirit, from the spirit, you will reap eternal life. Let's be those who yield to the spirit. It says about Jesus as a high priest in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is help, he is able to help those who are being tempted, tempted. Now look, temptation is common to man. It's a pressure that's applied to your spirit. And it is, when you experience pressure, it's difficult. So the scripture says that God can sympathize with us. Jesus took on flesh to show how it's done. And he can sympathize with your weaknesses. And if you are being drawn into temptation in some fleshly lust or some attitude or something appeal to Jesus as your high priest For the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a godly and upright life but we do have to lean on Jesus he is the cornerstone as much as we hear from everybody we have to lean on Jesus and call on his name the grace we need to get out of this situation. So you may be struggling. Maybe you're trapped in a sin. Maybe you're trapped in a bad habit. Lean on Jesus. You come to Jesus the honor and finish your faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is ever present, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We, whether we like it or not, we are living in a world where there is actually such an amount of temptation so easily available to people, it's frightening. By the advent of the internet, you, at a moment of weakness, one moment of weakness, you are exposed to some of the most vile acts human beings have ever perpetrated. One moment of weakness. 
and we're all the time being being encouraged, you know, to uh, you know to keep up with the technology and do this, that, and the other. And I'm afraid, you know, what technology has done in corrupting human beings is um, is unconscionable, really. And I know my daughter started secondary school. They've told her phones are banned. There's a young kid in her school. He came across something he shouldn't have seen. His teacher, the teacher, um, found out. He begged the teacher not to tell him. The school principal. She told the school, the school principal. And the young kid begged the pretend principal not to tell him her father, his father. And she said, I have to tell your father. And the poor young lad could not call. And I knew he could guess the rest. And we need to be cognizant. Jesus walked it out. There are certain things Jesus said as safeguards. Coming to church is a good idea because it's a God idea. Leaning on Jesus and being real with us and I can't cope with this. I can't handle this. It's a good idea. Because he's the cornerstone. Some things you're not meant to cope with. But he's the cornerstone. He's the one who takes it. He's the one who, who, who can handle it, if you like. We need to be cognizant. We also need to be careful with each other. Because we should have a duty of care to one another to some extreme, to some degree. And if some of us are struggling with something, there should be a place where you can speak to someone and say, I'm actually struggling with sin. Can you help me out here? The scripture says, you who are spiritual, you know, restore that person. That's not about beating us up the whole time. That is about perfecting us and bringing us into his good works he's prepared in advance for us to do. I don't want to say anything more about it. It was the, the idea in my mind was on foundation, and there's a whole other angle on this. But I just I think I probably said all I I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to say this morning on this, but I just want us to be honest this morning, because this is the best thing to do with God. And if you're struggling with sin, and it doesn't have to be an extremely bad habit. But maybe it's an attitude. Just an attitude. A wrong attitude to somebody. Maybe you're struggling with unforgiveness. Maybe you're struggling with pride. Pride's a hard thing to spot sometimes. You can have it, not even know. Maybe you're struggling, you know, with, with whatever, with your relationship with God even. Maybe you're struggling with people you know. Um, maybe you're struggling with the lusts of the flesh and all of this various forms. But just just this morning, if you are, I don't want to put anyone on the spot here, let's just be real with God. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, precious, beloved by God. We're the holy temple that's been formed and fitted together. Take your issues to God. Take your issues to Christ. And tell him what you have to tell him. And invite God's grace into your life. Invite God's help into your life. Invite God's strength into your life. And I just feel, just feel to pray this at the end. If you're this morning and you feel that there's just not enough in you of God's power to be able to say no when it's something you're struggling with or something in your heart, come up here this morning and I would just pray for the grace of God to be supplemented into your heart that you might be able to withstand whatever it is your feeling is, you know, is pressure to you at this point. So I just leave it at that. And if that's you, anybody here, I'm willing to pray. And yeah, and just that's it. Okay.